Well, hello, everybody. Todd Woodbridge here. Welcome to our Facebook live chat with Dylan Alcott. It's always a pleasure to catch up with the great man. And Dylan, I've, I've caught up with you in quarantine. Welcome home to Australia. But firstly, a, a huge congratulations on your performance in Paris. Thanks, Todd. Mate, I've got to say, your current situation is looking a lot better than my current situation. It looks very, <laughs> look, you've got a bit of breeze where you are. I've got no windows. Um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that, mate. It's um, obviously such a strange year. And I, you know, I don't think anyone really thought the French Open was going to get up. So to be able to play it, it you know, we were staying a stone throw from the Eiffel Tower. I feel very lucky to even being able to go and then to play so well. I don't know about you, mate, but I used to hate clay because you get dirty. It's a pain in the backside, but I've got to stop saying that because now I've won two yeah. Roland Garros's. Yeah, so I, I, I had a good time. Um, no, I didn't like clay. I used to like clay after about eight or nine weeks, which meant it was the end of the season and <laughs> the grass. It's weirdly <laughs> almost be starting to play well by then. Um, but <laughs> talk about um, your experience for us um, in Paris. Um, to, to, to win another Grand Slam, the emotion of that, I watched your, your speech on court and, um, and that was really special because that was the first time in Paris you guys have got to play on a show court as well. Yeah, you know, obviously I'm so lucky to be from Australia and the support that I get from everybody at Tennis Australia. I've been, I've been playing on Rod Laver now for a few years and to have 10,000 people there, you know, this year for the final, a million people watching it on the wide world of sports, you know, that stuff just doesn't happen in other places around the world or it didn't. And now, how cool is that? That other Grand Slams have started to follow the lead. And um, yeah, that was the first time any wheelchair finals were played on on Susan Langland Court, one of the main courts at the at the Roland Garros site, which was special, really was. And you know how much that stuff means to me. And and to even get a broadcast back here into Australia was awesome. So many so many people watched it and things like that. It was just it's awesome. It, it, it's life changing for, for obviously me, but hopefully you know for a lot of young people with disabilities who see people like them and and for other federations to realise that people want to watch wheelchair tennis. You know what I mean? It was it was cool. Now you you. you... You said take the lead, you know, putting you on a center court. But talk about taking the lead because um, several months ago, you weren't even going to be able to play at the US Open. You took the lead. And that was a pretty huge moment in tennis to be able to turn uh, the thoughts around of the USTA and, and make all of that happen, wasn't it? Yeah, and I didn't think it was going to do anything. Um, I just wrote those tweets you know, obviously the US uh, Open made the decision to not have wheelchair tennis and they didn't tell us, they just kind of did it and they put out a press release and, and didn't mention wheelchair tennis. And we spoke about this personally, Todd. It just, I was sad, mate. Like, you know how upset I was. And that's why I wrote those tweets saying that I felt like it was unfair and people wanted to watch it and give us the opportunity. I promise you, we won't let you down. And, um, you know, did I think it would be on the third page of the New York Times? Mm -hmm. No. Did I... Did I think Andy Murray was going to call me on my phone when I was sitting on the couch and say, I just spoke to Roger and Rafa and Novak and the boys and we put it in the WhatsApp. They've got a top 20 WhatsApp. Didn't know that either. And they said, mate, we want to help. And they then, you know, they then tried to help and called the USDA and asked them to change their decision. And shout out to the US Open as well, who said, yep, we stuffed up. We understand. And we're going to, you know, put the wheelchairs on. And, um, you know, it was, all, it, was, it was great. It was a great tournament as well. And, if the US Open hadn't have done it, maybe the French Open wouldn't have had it. Maybe I wouldn't have went away at all. Who knows? So um, it, it, it wasn't me. It was the support of everybody, to be honest. I think we, as a tennis community, really got behind it. And um, it, it was also cool to have all the able-bodied players, men's and women's, come up and say, hey, Dill, so awesome to have you here. Like, that, I, you know, I'm so glad we could help. And, but also, like, you always deserve to be here. You know, it meant a lot to me. So to also... I stuffed it up at the US Open, didn't win, unfortunately, um, in the final. But it, 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 I, I felt like there was a chance for redemption at the at the French Open, and I played the guy that beat me um, at the French at, at the US Open in the semi final, and actually played really well, and got, I got the win there, six four six two, um, and uh, I, I he's going to be kicking my backside pretty soon, to be honest. He's, he's an up and coming young player, so to be able to rectify that was pretty cool at Roland Garros. Yeah, that, that was Sam Schroeder that, that you were talking about, Chris beat Andy Lapthorn in, in the final. Um, when you talk about, um, you know, Andy giving you a, a message and a call, I, I often wonder with you, because you, you've met some pretty high flyers, what, what's the phone book like? You know, if I was to steal your phone, who, who could I call? Who's sitting in there? There's a lot in there. I mean, besides yourself, obviously, which is, <laughs> which is just, you're a heartthrob of the tennis community. So... 
Uh, look, there's lots of good numbers in there. And I tell you what, though, even though there is, you still get surprised when Andy Murray calls and says g'day. Yeah. And, um, and uh, you know, it, it just also made me, I guess, humble the fact that I think of a, a while ago when I first came back to tennis, I, I maybe thought like we might have been a bit of an inconvenience to the top players. You know what I mean? Like where we start the second week, we're in the locker room. What do they think of us? You don't really know. You know what I mean? And I can honestly tell you, like there's none of that. And yep. just to have the respect of them and them say, we want, you deserve the same opportunities we have. You know, we're going to try and help you do that. I know the whole wheelchair tennis community really appreciated that, but also the fact that they just love it as elite sport. Like they just see us as elite tennis players, just like them. You know what I mean? And it's so great that they see that. And I know in Australia, broadcasters see that, sponsors see that, ticket holders see that. And I think we're, leading the way for the rest of the world to realise that people want to watch this stuff. And I hope that we just leave it in a better spot for the next generation of young tennis players, but also Paralympic athletes for the next 50 years, you know what I mean? Because that's kind of what they deserve, in my opinion. How do you feel um, with yourself? And, and, and probably you haven't had time to reflect on it, but, you know, wheelchair tennis has grown exponentially because of some of, of what you've been able to do in, in a sense your personality because you're so big you're so bright and and positive but there's been brad parks we've we've had david hall here in australia world champion um you know Danny he's Toro. yeah and, and all olympian or paralympians rather and you've kind of taken it though to a, a different perspective how have you managed to do that um and and what more do you want to do with it I mean, first and foremost, I'd have nothing without the people that you mentioned, as you said, Danny Toro, Hawley, Brad Parks, who's been massive in America and all around the world and things like that. So um, they, I guess, led the foundations. And I think the biggest thing that made me sad for them is uh, they didn't get the exposure they deserved. You know what I mean? They were winning Grand Slams and they had to fund it. They had no money. Like, that sucked. And I think one of the things that I have been able to do is... I mean, the, the ability to be able to work in the media and, and market yourself in that way. But I think the reason that I've had cut through as well is I am just 100% me all the time. And what we're doing right now, Todd, is the same way that you and I would talk when we're having a beer, correct? <laughs> like, like I'm, I'm a bit of a goose all the time, you know what I mean? And, but also, you know when that happened with the US Open? I didn't want to call it out because I don't want people writing on Twitter abusive messages to me that my mum sees and my mum calls me in tears going, why are they saying that about you? You know what I mean? Like things like US Open doing what everyone should do because no one gives a crap about people with disabilities. Like really brutal things. But you have to be vulnerable and you have to be authentic to you. You know what I mean? And I was just being me. I just said, look, I'm sad. This hurt me. And I'm glad I put myself out there because I always put myself out there because I just want to be me. And um, when I wanted to, I remember we, when we've been working in the media for a while together, mate, and I remember the first time I got the opportunity to, to interview Rafael Nadal, it was during a fast forward thing. And the, they said, yeah, but how are you going to interview Rafael Nadal? Right. And I said, I'm just going to put a microphone in his face like everybody else. And they said, oh yeah, you know what I mean? And I remember seeing an image of me holding up a microphone, interviewing Rafael Nadal. He was standing up. I was in a wheelchair, but guess what? Neither of us cared. And that was powerful. And I also didn't know if I'd be able to do it. You know what I mean? But I've always just backed myself in and I would be nothing without the people that supported me. And it's Tennis Australia. It's, it's Channel 9 now. It used to be Channel 7. You know, all the networks that, that gave me all the opportunities to do things. It, it, was, a, it was a group effort. And um, I just want to keep going with it, mate. I want to keep playing tennis for at least till the Paralympics. But I always say... Why couldn't Brad Pitt be in a wheelchair? Why couldn't Jimmy Fallon be in a wheelchair? Bit rigid, you know not I mean? like Brad Pitt, mate. Okay. Exactly, yeah. Minus the looks. Maybe who's someone better, not as good looking? <laughs> DiCaprio? No, I'm kidding. Um, but, but you know what I mean? Like, why couldn't... I, there, there's never really been a Hollywood star in a wheelchair. Like, and I'm serious. Like, you know, that whenever there's an actor playing a role of someone in a wheelchair, they're able-bodied. It's like, why couldn't you have a wheelchair actor? You know, and I always think like that. So, who knows, mate? Who knows? Maybe some... Could do some stuff in government. I've got no idea, but I'm just enjoying what I'm doing at the moment. 
you've, you've taken me off on so many different tangents that I could go in that little that in that answer. But I'm going to pull you back just a little bit, and I want you to go back to to tennis and talk me through um, going away on this last trip, going to New York, um, the bubble there, then heading into Europe. Obviously, you went down to to Nice and and played a tournament um, that you won in the lead up to, to Roland Garros. Um, but the two, the differences between the bubble, the travel, um, those experiences that are obviously so different from what we Oh, know. yeah. First and foremost, I want to say my love to everybody in Australia. Like, um, I know I'm from Melbourne and the, it's been hard, you know, and um, hopefully, you know, everyone is doing the right thing and hopefully we can change the restrictions pretty soon and things like that. And, but, First and foremost, I felt lucky to go away. Um, I thought and the US Open and the French Open both did a great job in protecting the players. Um, there was parts where I was a bit scared though as well. When I was down in Nice before, I had about a week where I was outside of a bubble because there was no wheelchair tournaments. And when there's 25,000 cases a day in a country, they're wearing masks on their elbows. Um, it's, you know, I tell you what, I've, I've never felt more anxiety then going into Roland Garros for that first coronavirus test mm. because you're doing the right thing, but you can't control the population, you know? And I saw a lot of other players felt the same way. Matt, I couldn't sleep. Like I was so worried that I had it, that I, that, that I felt fine, but you just don't know, you know? And um, that was, that was nerve wracking. Um, in flying, I've, you had to wear a face mask for 35 hours from Melbourne to New York going the wrong way. Not going via America, going via Doha. Man, I hopefully I never have to do that again. But you had to do it to do the right thing. Um, I flew via Tokyo to get Our flight got cancelled five times on the way home. We might not have come home till December. We luckily got a flight. Um, we went through Tokyo airport. Just so many people have lost their jobs all around the world. I'm worried about them. Tokyo airport, peak hour, 6.30 on a Sunday. I saw three people in the terminal. Wow. Tokyo, Tokyo unheard airport. Of. Unheard like, of. Unheard of. And, and just to experience that is, it was really special, but also, you know, you realise that this has really changed the world, you know, and a lot of people, you know, would have lost a lot out of it. What about the players? Um, because once you did get back, back into the bubble, how, how are, are all they reacting? Do they have those same issues, the anxiety that you have? And of course, the next tournament, the big one is down here and, and Tennis Australia are, are, are prepping every possible scenario. Um, and and what, what could they have learned from your experiences that you can give the info and say, hey, these are, these are a couple of focal points? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what the rest of the world are doing, the tennis players, they're fist pumping about the opportunity to come to Australia because some of their countries have, you know, crazy amount of numbers and things like that. I, I, I think the, the players felt privileged and, and lucky to be able to play, to be honest because a lot of people can't do their jobs at the moment. So I think we, don't, we didn't take that for granted. One thing is that we missed everybody, <laughs> missed the fans and things like that. Um, it, I noticed it the most when I won Roland Garros and I looked up and there was my beautiful partner, Chantel, uh, who, and it was so great to have her there because she helped me all throughout the whole thing, you know, getting through airport. I can't travel by myself, Todd. With being in a chair, it's too hard with all my stuff and that. So she was amazing help, but not having my team there and not having my coach there and not having potentially hundreds, if not thousands of people there cheering, you know, you don't, you miss that. You miss the, the fans, the people that love tennis. So that was another thing. But I got to say that the way that the Grand Slams looked after us was incredible. And the way that the Australian Open, if I know, you know, my family well, Craig and everybody, they'll do such a good job. And I think they'll also protect the community as well. You know what I mean? It's not just about protecting us as tennis players. It's about protecting everybody around us as well, you know? And um, it's, it's obviously going to be hard, but I think I can say to all Australian tennis fans, get ready for, you know, the Australian Open is going to do an incredible job. They really are. And um, to all the players, I know they're very excited to come here and, and, and do it in a safe way. Um, the, the two weeks quarantine, no one's excited about, but um, that's something that you're going to have to do to be able to get in here. So that's what I'm doing right now. Everybody said, "Oh, you want to go out of quarantine, mate? Yeah. Because you're famous." I said, "Mate, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a hotel room as well. We 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 should tell. So we're we're doing it just like everybody else." Which, 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 which makes me ask the question: You got to your hotel in Sydney with some rather unusual transportation uh, means. I oh, made. I got off a plane. It's 
so different. You go through customs, there's army, there's cops, you get tested, like temperature, you get, you go outside, the army escorts you. And then I get out there and there's like four coaches, like big buses, because each bus takes a certain amount of passengers to each hotel. They don't know, you don't know which hotel you're going to. And then I'm in New South Wales and I've got to say, New South Wales police, the army, everyone was so lovely. Um, but they go, oh no, you're not on that, mate, you're in this. And it was a divvy van. It was a paddy wagon. It was a cop car. And I'm thinking, I'm in a, I'm in a, co- I'm in a cop car. I'm like, what's going on here? So, because obviously the buses weren't accessible. So I got, I got a police escort to my hotel. And it was funny. They were all like, mate, congrats about French Open. You know, so excited to take you. Uh, yeah, I haven't been, I'm, I don't know about you, Tony. I know you used to be a bad boy, but I have not been. Uh, arrested or in a cop car myself so this was the uh the first time thank you thank you so much for raising um my wonderful olympic experience that's great of you um (laughs) (laughs) now there's one thing that i you know always love when when i get to work with you and chat with you and watch you is is your sense of humor and there there was a great tweet that um you put out i think tweet and and on insta was about asking kiki burton's to play some mixed um now that was a little cheeky i mean poor old kiki's gone down with cramps and she's being wheeled off and um and and there you are inserting yourself with humor about yourself i kind of like that about you yeah do you know what i checked into the the pullman Eiffel Tower, the hotel, and guess who's standing there checking out after she lost? Oh. Well, I don't know if she saw it, but I, I wasn't bagging her. I was just saying, no, I, I, don't. Need, I need a doubles partner if you want to play yeah. some mix. Uh, yeah, she had like hectic cramps, the poor thing, and, and got wheelchair out. Um, but yeah, when, uh, she did say hi, which was nice, but she didn't mention the tweet, so I don't know if she saw it. <laughs> so, so tell me about your, your humour, though, because one of the great attributes is that is you use humour about yourself and about your disability to actually you know tell messages to teach people how did you how did you manage to get yourself psycho psychologically able to do that and and just talk to talk to me a little bit more about your humor and what you do with it yeah i mean i think one of the best ways to normalize anything is through humor you know what i mean and and i felt that my disability wasn't normalized for society. Um, I felt like they were awkward about it and things like that. And I think one of the best ways to break down those barriers is to be able to sometimes take the mickey out of yourself. You know what I mean? And I don't take myself too seriously. And I think that's why people watching take the mickey out means to, to, yeah, don't take yourself. Yeah. Don't take yourself too seriously. Exactly. Right. Or we say, take the piss out of yourself. Yeah. uh, That's annoying. Um, And, and I think, um, you know, I've been able to have cut through in mainstream media even the tennis community and things like that is because I, I, I do make, you know, fun of myself a bit, but not in a, not in a crude way, but just in a way that I guess um, it eliminates some of that alienation that sometimes happens with disability, but also it, it gives you the freedom to be like, Oh, Oh my yeah. God, it's actually funny. He doesn't, he's okay with it. So yeah. it means you can be okay with it. Yeah. And I know where you're, it's always great when, you know, the first couple of times you work together, Toddy, I might say a wheelchair joke and I can see you, your eyes go, oh my God, what's he doing? You know what I mean? But now we know that we can make it together. And, and but also like, it, it's the same way that it shows people that because I'm comfortable with it, you can be comfortable about it too. And I think it's a lesson that we can, you know, all learn, but especially people um, with a disability, it's just be proud of your disability. You know what I mean? The re- I w- was proud of it. And that's why I had the ability to be able to make those kinds of things. And yeah, it's one of the ways that I had that cut through. So I've got, I've got two words and you'll know these words because you've used them. Um, and I really, I really loved them and how you talked about them. It was perception and able. Talk about those two words for me. Oh, I mean, I think the key to life is, 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 is the way that you... Per- so it's not the events in life that dictates the life that you live. It's how you perceive those events that determines the path that you take. And people, the example that I give is when my mum and dad say, hey, um, I've got to go to the Paralympic Games to watch my son compete. What do you think the first thing people say is? It's not, that's awesome. They say, oh my God, I'm so sorry, what happened? Right? Their perception is that that's a bad thing because I'm disabled, right? My own perception of my disability and my life is that I'm easily the luckiest guy in the world, Tom. I'm so lucky that I was born with a tumor. I'm so lucky to be doing what I'm doing. And um, I perceive my situation in a way that I just try and find the most positive things out of it so I can live the best life that I can. And, um, you know, I, I'm really, you know, some people shy away from the 
um, the word disabled. They're like, no, no, I'm not disabled, but I'm like, I am disabled. And guess what? There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I am able in so many different ways or so many ways that you might be. The only difference is you and I might do some things differently. You know what I mean? Um, so that's why I called my book Able. Um, I've got a, a, a food company, um, a, a ready-made meal service where we're going to provide food for people with disability. It's called Able Foods. You know, uh, I, uh, I've got a podcast called Listen Able because I want to promote all the things that we we can do, you know what I mean? There's things like that. But even though I do say able, I still am definitely proud of the fact that I have a disability and I don't shy away from that. No, I, I hear you talk a lot and get to meet and it's always always come away from it personally, refreshed and go, yeah, get your focus back, Todd, and 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 and, and look in that positive manner. That's one of your amazing attributes. Um, now, within that answer, you talked about um, the Paralympics and a, a little earlier in our conversation, you mentioned, oh, I might play till then. So I'm, I'm presuming you're at least playing till the Paralympics. And I oh, mean, definitely. Maybe, we, we don't know we don't know whether it may even go ahead at this particular point, but, but you know, what, what's the, the plan? Give us a bit of a long-term plan. But yeah. I was, I was definitely, um, obviously going to, I'm definitely top playing to the Paralympics. Uh, again, I'm an honest guy. I can't tell you how devastated I was when it got postponed. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons I didn't play as well at the U S open is because I was thinking I should have been at the Paralympics right now. <laughs> and that, and I think it's okay to be sad about that. You know what I mean? And I think we all, um, it's been such a rough year. And I think as soon as I accepted the fact that I was sad about it, I played better. You know what I mean? And um, the re I'm just, uh, if you take money out of it and, and things like that, because obviously we don't get the same prize money as our able-bodied players and things, um, the Paralympics is the holy grail, yeah? Olympics and Paralympic gold medal, holy grail of sport. So uh, it, I can't wait till Tokyo. And um, I hope the world's going to get it better, hopefully. <laughs> And it can go ahead because that's what I've been training for for so long and things like that. And to be able to represent Australia means everything to me. Represent my family, my friends, Tennis Australia, you, everybody that has supported me. That's why I do what I do. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and to be able to do that at the Paralympics would be amazing. And um, I know Japan's doing everything in their power. I think it'll go ahead, man. I do. The world of sport somehow has recovered. Um, and everything's going ahead pretty well as long as they've got the right bio you know, the biosecurity things in place. So I'm confident that it will. Now we'll, we'll close it up here in a minute, but what have you learnt um, most about yourself? Um, and this is probably a harder one for you because you, you obviously talk about learnings about your whole life, but through 2020, where, where so many people have been put in different positions, what have you learnt? I think it's the one thing that I learned is it is completely okay to say, I'm not feeling okay throughout 2020. Um, when it first happened and the Paralympics got cancelled and Wimbledon got cancelled, uh, I always spooked that you have to be really, you know, talk about what's going on. And then my, my Chantel, my partner was like, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, I'm all good. I'm fine. And then I was just not good. Like I, as soon as I started saying, nah, I'm actually gutted that I can't go to the Paralympics this year. And I am shattered that uh, we're in lockdown and people are, passing away and we're all losing our jobs and things like that. And as soon as I started talking about it, Todd, I felt better. Mm -hmm. And it was a lesson that you, as soon as you are more vulnerable with the people that you love and even your coworkers, even your coach for me as a tennis player, even your doubles partner, even, you know, your people that you love, as soon as you're more vulnerable, you feel better because they can help you and you can talk about things. And um, same after the U S open, I normally would have lost the match and, got into my shell a bit, but I was pretty upfront and I was like, I'm got it. Like I need a few days off, you know, and, and I talked about it with my coach and my partner. We were away together, Chantel, and, and it just helped, you know what I mean? And I think that's why I was able to rebound so well um, and, and play so well at Roland Garros. The other big thing is um, we live in a beautiful world where people really support each other. Like it's been tough, especially for people in Melbourne and somehow we've all got through this. You know what I mean? And it's because we've all done it together. So let's all keep looking after each other because we need it more than ever. And hopefully, especially in Australia, you know, we we can be a, a world leader, I guess, and show the rest of the world how to do it. And hopefully we can all get back to some sort of normality pretty soon. Well, there couldn't be a better way to finish than the, with, with those wise, wise words. And, um, mate, Dylan, thank you so much for, um, for chatting to me. As you know, I'm in Melbourne. I've been in lockdown for 10-something weeks, but um, looking forward to hopefully out and seeing some more family and friends. And um, 
I won't be travelling like you for a little while, but I look forward to seeing you back down in Melbourne at some point once you're um, out of your quarantine. Well done. Another Grand Slam title. Um, 11 singles titles. Um, eight doubles titles. Is that what it is? Can you tell me the numbers. because I think so. I think you nailed it. You yeah. nailed it. Um, and, and I think I just want to say to everyone in Australia, everyone around the world watching this, um, I see all the messages. It means so much to me. And I still get goosebumps thinking about it that, Six years ago, Todd, eight, I used to play the Australian Open. There was eight people there, yeah. and half of them were my family. Now you're, trend, you're trending online. People, you know, I still can't believe it, mate. And I'm nothing without everybody else. So to everyone, they got in touch. Thank you. And mate, we normally see each other at least like once a month. I haven't seen you in six months. I'm, I hate it. I need to get a bit of Todd Woodbridge flesh time. So I'm looking forward to it, mate. <laughs> you're a champion. Well done, mate. Thanks so much See, for joining. And we'll, and we'll sign off on that. Um, to everybody uh, watching here on Facebook Live, that was Dylan Orcott. I'm Todd Woodbridge. Thanks for joining us.